Hello and welcome back to the Oxford Online Maths Club, a weekly show coming to you from the University of Oxford. My name's James and this week I'm joined by Matt Parker, um, all the way over, over a Zoom call. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I was here the whole time. Hello, James, it's an absolute pleasure, pleasure to join. It's fantastic to have you on the show, Matt. Uh, people have mentioned your stuff below in in the chat in the chat before, so I thought since it's a leap year, let's let's actually get you on the show. <laughs> that's true. I come on the show once every fourth year. Oh yeah, that's that's the uh, that's the arrangement. Not every hundred years. Right. It's yeah. Okay. So season roughly two hundred of Maths Club. We'll have to, we'll have to skip that one more or less. That's what we're doing today, isn't it? <laughs> um, hi to people in chat. Um, Shrist in chat says, congratulations on 8,000 subscribers. Uh, I've got a plan for this, which is 8,000, fine, but slightly more than 8,000, you've got options. Um, because there's a perfect number, there's a power of two, there's there's all sorts we can do around around about 8,000. Oh, yeah, 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 there's a perfect number. Not not within, within but it's very shortly, it's 8,100 something, isn't it? Uh, yeah, uh, I guess, are you getting close to 33 million, Matt, for the next? <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be? One day, one day. If, uh, I, if I combine forces with several of my more popular friends, <laughs> we, mm. <laughs> we would have 33 million, of which I would contribute a very small amount. Right. If we're allowed to add in, add in everyone together, maybe across all of the maths. I think all of the online maths community would have 33 million subs. It would be nice, wouldn't it? Um, okay, quick plugs before before we start talking about leap years, which is which is the plan. Very quickly plugging the summer school that I mention each week at the moment. Um, it's called Promise Europe. It's in Oxford. Uh, people come for six weeks six weeks of doing loads of mathematics. Um, if that sounds if you're watching and that sounds like the sort of thing that you'd like to do, then you can find out more on the Promise Europe website. Um, they have some really tricky maths problems to decide who goes on their summer school. So I always say that even if you're not going to go on Promise Europe, you might like to have a look at their tricky maths problems. Uh, and if that sounds like too much maths or too far away, uh, we also do uh, open days for our maths degree courses. This is weird. It feels like I'm advertising the open days to Matt Parker. Um, <laughs> not quite my target audience. If I can solve the problem, I get to come along to it. Yeah, yeah you, you know. Uh, what well, have we got? 16 plus, yeah, pre, uh, pre-university. I'm 16. <laughs> I'm older than 16. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Multiple. From which I think we deduce your birthday is probably not a leap year. Oh no, I never know how it works with people whose birthday is a leap year. If it's your birthday today at home, then happy birthday. Um, hi, if you haven't missed very much yet. Uh, I always like to start by checking how people's day was. Um, I have a five star, five star poll for this. Um, so people can let us know how their day's going. Uh, Matt, how's your day going? <laughs> Let's go from one to five. It's going well. It's a busy day. As we were having a bit of a chat before, I was mentioning that my um, my new book pre-order started today. Ah. I saw someone in the chat said that they got an email from me like 25 minutes ago. Zoe, Zoe, yes, you did get an email from me 25 minutes ago because a lot of people like uh, pre-registered to find out about the pre-pre-orders. Wait, so, hello. You had a sign-up mailing list for people to I find out a, about the announcement a, for the pre-orders. Uh, yes, yes. You people were able to register and pre-order, finding out about the pre-orders. So it was a second-degree pre-order. And Zoe was one of those people. And I've written. I, I don't know if you enjoyed the email, Zoe, but I've written my own terrible Python code that uh, automates sending out emails. So it's it's it's. It is a it is a, a mail merge email, Zoe. I do apologise, but the code that sent it was handcrafted by me, so I think that counts as a as a personal touch. Uh, chats do it having a lovely day. They're at four point two at the moment, which is pretty good. So I think what we've learned from that is we need more February the 29th so that so chat can have more four point two kind of days. Four and five are currently tying. Um, Questions in chat. Um, one, one's more of a comment about Matt's Python code that I don't know what they're referring to for your history. Oh, of Python, code? Terrible Python code. Yeah, I have an on, ongoing uh, theme um, joke. I don't know. It's not a joke though. It's very, very real, very serious. That I write terrible Python code, and so I find the solution to a lot of life's problems is to write some terrible Python code. And I'm often torn 
And actually, I'll take people's comments on this. For all you fine young people coming up in the educational world, I'm always torn with sharing my Python code because on one hand it's terrible and it's not showing you best practice for writing code. But on the other side, I want to show how easy it is and it, you don't have to be great at programming to throw some code together to, to do some mathematical investigations. So a lot of my terrible Python code is I want to find out a math thing, so I, I, I code it up. And so I do try and, I try and show the fact that it's easy to do and my code isn't very good while also encouraging people that it's, if you actually want to go into software development, don't, don't base any of your life decisions on my terrible Python code, which is why I, I, I routinely call it terrible Python code. I want to, I find that's <laughs> the shortest way to get across all those concepts in one three word sentence. It's something about having a go and just getting stuck in that exactly. you know, Give it a go. carries over with. Um, I mean, the, the, the complete overlap for people who are familiar with the um, Parker Square, Magic Square I found, is I found that by writing some terrible Python code. So, you know, it's, it's <laughs> terrible code all the way down. It's the, the one with, yeah, square numbers in a magic square yep. and, and some more properties. So I see that's absolute win. Um, Perfectly balanced. Can we bring it full circle back to leap years? So our theme today is approximating numbers and doing it as well as you can, but getting it almost but not quite right. I don't know, that's almost that's almost a link back. Um, we've got you on the show because you made a video about leap years. I guess it must have been a multiple of four years ago. <laughs> good point, good point. Was it last leap year? Or <laughs> Was it? I think it was, it was like two, I think it was eight years ago. Okay, two leap years ago, you made a video about leap years. Um, where you have opinions that I think you should be, uh, be allowed to air on, on this show as well about how leap years should work. Um, I mean, I like leap years. And you've got an a alternate argument, so we will let yeah, I think maybe the, we... learning, the, the learners of home decide. Yep. So the issue for people, if you've not spent much time thinking about leap years, is the Earth's orbit isn't a multiple of a number of years. And there's no reason for it to be a multiple of a number of years. Oh, if my signal drops out, let me know. I think I'm still alive. You're good, you're good. <laughs> Excellent. Um, because the Earth, I mean, the, the, the solar system is a big sloshy mess. And my, I mean, my wife is, is a solar physicist, so she's a space scientist who studies the solar system. And so she gets very upset how dismissive I am of the solar system because it's a nightmare. But as all the, you know, chunks of matter were settling out of the protoplanetary plane, there was no reason why the amount of angular momentum causing the Earth to spin, giving us the day, would be a, a neat, you know, would divide neatly into how long it happens to take the Earth to go all the way around the sun. And that is, I mean, our, our distance around the sun is entirely determined by our orbit length, um, minus mild gravitational impacts. Whereas the Earth's day is part is, is more angular momentum, but we are slowing down. There's com complicated tidal and gravity things that change the length of the day. So I have other opinions about leap seconds. We can get to that. But the, 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 the point is, the orbit of the Earth, if you measure it in days, is 365.2422 or 219. You were discussing. Yeah, I'm going to go to 24219. Because it gives it gives me an edge and an argument later on. Oh, I'll put up. Oh, I need it. I need it. Yes, one point. Oh, amazing. So now this is why uh, James's thing was approximating numbers. You look at that and you're like, well, your first approximation is just 365. Good approximation. And so you make your year 365 days long. But the problem is, every year when you celebrate midnight on New Year the Earth still has a quarter of a day left to go, like six hours of moving in terms of being back where it started. So every year, the place where the Earth is in the orbit goes back by six hours. So it, it goes back a day every, you know, um, four years. And so the issue is, you end up gradually drifting away, which, which wouldn't matter if we had a nice, neat circular orbit and the, the Earth stood up straight, like someone with good posture. But it doesn't. It slumps over and the orbit's an ellipse. So this means the seasons drift around and people kind of want the seasons to stay where they are. 
So uh, next order approximation was uh, famously the Julian calendar, brought in by uh, Julius Caesar. Before, I mean, other people had other solutions before then. I don't know if anyone else has. I mean, I liked some of them. Some of them are really good. Some were, you know, you wait a while until the difference is noticeable, and then you have a big extra festival. Like, you just pause the calendar. You're like, well, stop. Pause the date. And then you have a couple days off for a big party, and then you, you, pick, the, you pick up exactly where you left off. And that way, you, you've brought everything back into alignment by adding in some extra dates. And that was done, that was the, before Julius Caesar, that's what they did in Rome. The issue is they left it down to the ruling, um, the, the, whoever's ruling to, to decide, and they were often biased because they either want to sh lengthen their term by putting in the <laughs> extra big holiday there, or shorten the next person's term by locking in a, a skipping one, and then the next person has a shorter reign because, um, you, you skip. So as soon as they're like, if you do something by committee, it's the worst solution imaginable. Yeah. So, um, Which links to Caesar said, we're gonna yeah. make a better approximation. So is that that's the three hundred sixty-five point two five kind of approximation? I I think. Yep. Yep. Um, I like the idea of having a big party, um, and I, I sort of wish that the leap years we had were big parties. Yeah. Uh, I have a. I. I still think there's room for that as a solution. I think a lot of maths problems can be solved with, well, why don't we have a party? And in this case, it's quite a literal solution to the issue. Um, mm. Which Probably. is kind of what we do. It is what we do now, where we put in, like we pause, because normally our calendar goes from the 28th of February to the 1st of March. And every four years, we pause it. And we do end up giving the next day like a number. We just call it the 29th of February and we treat it like a normal day, which is, that's where we're going wrong. What we're meant to do is pause it on the 28th, or, or wherever, or Feb, and then just have like a nothing day. Like, we give it a whole new name. It's like Funds Day or something, right? And then we have we have a special one-off, or it's the 0th of March Funds Day or something, right? Big old party, and then we pick up again and it would be the only zero index day, so we would know it's special. The fact that we give it 29, and 29 is a perfectly normal day to have in a month, is why I think it becomes very boring. But as I mentioned to you earlier, I'm, I'm meeting some friends for, for leap, leap day drinks tonight. We like to celebrate the leap day. One of our friends couldn't make it, so we're going to dedicate every fourth drink to them. Right. <laughs> but not every hundred. But not every hundred. <laughs> yeah. I have a personal bias. So my personal bias is that... Um, the 28th of February is my birthday, oh, um, really? so birthday. so I would I would quite like it to be like a kind of nothing like kind of nothing day, so that it's yeah. still my birthday perhaps, or, or I would accept a huge party that everyone takes the day off. Um, there you go. Oh, now I've revealed my a personal point. <laughs> not not exactly on Christmas, but within a couple of days of Christmas. And I can tell you, it's good. It's good. The festive season is not a bad time to have a birthday, so that would work out well. So, I mean. The only question then is, so in terms of approximating the number, they approximated it as a quarter. And the way you get a quarter day, people get very upset if you have like a midnight and then a midnight six hours later. So they had to put in like one day every four years. Um, we could have put in two days every eight years. That would that would work. We could put in, you know, seven, seven, put in a whole week. We put in a whole week every 28 years. Wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah. So, that well, be... so does that mean you get a week out of sync yeah. and then you sync yeah. up again? Yep. I'm kind of... Because on that scale, so, you know, it, it doesn't matter drifting a week. The seasons would move by a week. Is that too much? I don't know. Maybe, that, sort of... maybe we're letting them slip too much before we fix them. I'm sort of surprised people can notice the what... Hmm. So, obviously, if it was snowing in June, I'd notice that the calendar's gone a bit wrong. If you're telling me the, I don't know, equinox is, oh no, it's two days out, time to have a party. I'm sort of surprised people notice that, but then I remember that people build things like Stonehenge and those things that line up. Is this... It's a lot of effort to realign Stonehenge every time. Right. Have I got that right, though? Is it, is it true Stonehenge that Stonehenge is equinox. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, okay. So... Sol Sol solstice. It's solstice. 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 So it also lines up with the equinox by default with the solstice. The winter and the summer solstice. Solstice, I don't know what the plural is, uh, the big ones. My um, wife did go once for the summer solstice. 
Again, because she's a solar physicist, loves the sun, and she was filming for, there's a TV show in the UK for our international uh, learners called uh, The Sky at Night, and so she went along to do a program for The Sky at Night about the Arctic. And she got very upset that, uh, that most people there were just hippies, and no one, no one cared about the alignment of the sun, which no. I was <laughs> quite rightfully upset. Um, okay, but that's the thing we're trying to do, I suppose, to make sure that the calendar says the same thing. Stonehenge is right, it's lined up, yeah. it's telling us a true thing about where the sun is and where we are around the sun. And it'd be nice if we got our concepts of like March or whatever to line up with that. Okay, yeah. I'm on board. People at, well, at home, well, I'm on board a bit, I suppose. I haven't, I haven't looked at the chat for a second. I mean, yeah. Uh, everyone's in complete agreement. Um, <laughs> oh, interesting comment from Anonymous. Yeah. Wondering why it's February. And they pointed out it's because the year used to start on the 1st of March. I... And that's a very good point. What is that a thing? And that, yeah, so the, the year up until, oh goodness, reasonably recently, 1600s I want to say, used to start um, in March. And we still, in the UK, young people, you don't care about this yet. I think it used to be the 1st of April, if, I, if I'm 100% sure. So in the UK, I don't know if anyone has to do their taxes, but the tax year starts, go, is on the 5th. No, one tax year ends on the 5th of April, and the next one starts on the 6th of April. And people wonder, why, why is the tax year different to the real year? Well, it used to be the same as the real year, because the real year used to start and end at the beginning of April. And so you would do your taxes in line with the calendar, but then they moved the calendar to start January, but no one wanted to move the tax year because you, the government doesn't want people to pay less tax yeah. and, and, and uh, citizens don't want to pay more tax, so no one can agree with how you change it because someone's going to end up paying more or less than they should. So the whole calendar changed and the tax year didn't. And then in the 1700s, when... Um, and this is getting a little ahead of our story, the UK did switch to the, they were still in the Julian system. They switched to the one we're about to look at now. And that pushed, um, oh, was the first, was it like the 25th of March? Hmm. That pushed, again, they had to realign the calendar by taking out a bunch of days. And the tax year refused to move, which is why it's now on a weird date in early April. Because it used to be like the equinox at the end of March or something. And it just, it, it, it doesn't matter what moves, Governments come and go, empires rise and fall, the calendar drifts around. The tax year is the most consistent part of our of our calendar, bar nothing. <laughs> it's all set at... Is, is, so is the tax year... This can't be true, but is the tax year sort of doing 365 day years forever? That's not quite it's, true because it's... No, not quite true. It still has the leap year still bump it around. So... There are some mm. minor minor adjustments in the tax you're paying based on leap years or not. And I did a video a little while ago where there's mild discrepancies in the UK tax law based on the conversion numbers they use to switch between weeks and years. Oh, no. Because they don't use the exact ratio, but it's a weird ratio. It's 52 and a bit weeks of a year. And that they use the wrong ratio, and it means you pay slightly different amounts of tax depending on if you earn money weekly or monthly because of the, the, the conversion rate they use. But what the tax year doesn't do is budge. So <laughs> the tax year is, is an unbroken chain of celebrating the same beginning of the calendar year and it's the calendar that's done other stuff and it hasn't moved. It's like, no, that's what we do. Okay, okay. Um... Death and taxes, the only inevitable things. Well, yes. um, you know what gets young people interested in maths is taxes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> taxes and stories about the olden days. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so where are we up to in the story? We're at 365.25 in the Julian calendar, which is kind of close to 0 0.24219, but not... Yeah, close, close. Um, but not quite. And for a long so Julius Caesar brought in this new system, very clever. And for a long time it was great until, you know, 
one and a half millennia later, that slight discrepancy was starting to add up because we were still drifting. Was that going to be 0 0.00781? the days per, per year, we are still drifting away because we didn't need to have it exactly right. And so um, someone had to come up with a way to get those, to get a more accurate value out of just using fractions because mm. you can only add or remove a whole day. So this is where you and I and Pope Gregory are all going to disagree because the, the, the Gregorian calendar, because it was Pope Greg who rolled it out, it was actually an Italian uh, mathematician who used it working out. They decided, here's what we're going to do. We're going to stick with the Caesar plan of adding in an extra day every four years. But now we're adding in too much because we're adding in a whole quarter of a day on average. So we've got to take a little bit out. So they went, you know what, we will take out one day every 400 years. But now, Every hundred years, I'm sorry. So now you're taking out, on average, 0 0.01. So you're down to 0. Point, you're down to 365.24. And then they're like, oh, we've gone down too far. I know, we'll go back up again. So we're going to put back in a day every 400 years, which is putting in an extra 0. 0.0025, and that's where we are now. The other way of thinking about it is we put in... Um, one day every four years, and then we remove three days every 400 years. So, <laughs> so even if you if you do if you work that out, you're like, okay, three <laughs> days in 400 years is 0 0.0075, and one day every four years is 0.25, and 0.25 minus that gives you 3. Point, sorry, 365.24. And that's what we use to this day. That's our, that's our current solution. Still ever so slightly off. Mm. Oh, and just to address the chat, someone, I did refer to people who pay taxes as citizens. That's very true. People who aren't citizens pay tax. I've, um, as an as a, as a immigrant to the UK, I had to pay tax even when I wasn't a citizen. So that's a good point. Humans, regular humans. It's the question. Got very good accounting. Question again about how the Pope knows. Does the Pope well, know? How much this number does the Pope know? Or the Pope's mathematicians? Oh, that's a good point. I mean, the Pope's got astronomers and mathematicians. Um, the, pope, the Pope cared. The reason people cared is things like Easter were moving around. And then that's how you get the Pope's attention. Yeah. Sometime later, though, not, you know, obviously the, the other solutions were, were used by other cultures and other places around the world. So this is very much the Western Europe argument that was kicking off about popes. Um, England at the time didn't like the Pope and so didn't switch calendars. And that became a problem. Yes. When they did switch calendars, they didn't want to use the same maths done by the Pope, the, the, the papal mathematicians. So they had to come up with an alternate calculation for when Easter is that does, is different working out but gives the same answer. And one of the wonderful things about maths is you can have multiple workings out of the same thing that give you the same answer. And so there's a really, like the Church of England has such a convoluted calculation for when Easter is because they they wanted a different way of doing it. And there, that's... Yeah. So this is the thing about Easter being at different times of year. I know it, the calendar date of Easter is different each year, which is already... Odd. I don't know the calculation, but it pertains to when the moon does things, when yeah. the sun probably is doing stuff. It's, it's the really like you know. It's the first Sunday after the something after the something exactly. else. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Except in whatever something else. Um. So I suppose we have to assume that the Pope or the Pope's mathematicians were aware of this digit too. That's a great point. Um, because why one over four hundred, right? Why not? Or no? Do I hmm, do I mean that digit two, or do I mean this one? <laughs> That's kind of not two. To check and tell us in the chat which came first, the Gregorian calendar or the invention of the telescope. Ooh. I think we would need um, very accurate astronomy to be getting down to that level of detail in the orbit, and that's probably like that level of astronomy. If there were ways of doing it pre-telescope. But the telescope is really when astronomy switched into high gear. 
and suddenly there were way more accurate measurements. That said, before then, we still have very accurate ways to do angles and alignments, so I wouldn't rule it out. But I think post telescope definitely, and I think they're they're both probably around the same ish time. So it's an interesting question: Did mathematicians know the full value, or did they just know it was about 0.2425? Chance helped out. I think the calendar came before the telescope. Calendar the system before the telescope. The system I've got in mind, and I don't think anyone did this, would be to stand at Stonehenge with an hourglass or something yep, and wow. keep flipping it until a year's a passed whole year. a whole year <laughs> keep flipping it and then yeah. and then you'll know then you'll know because the sun is supposed to line up with the thing you have to hope it's not night time but the sun's I supposed to line up with the thing and then you'll say oh no I'm it's out by accumulating errors here but yeah <laughs> because yeah <laughs> how much accuracy do you need you need um Oh gosh, we're already talking about one hundredth of a day, which is it's such a small amount of time. Oh, really? A few minutes. And, and that we're to, we're down to thousands of a day to get that level of resolution, which is what three point six seconds. No, that's an hour. Sorry. Uh, oh, okay. So it's tens of seconds. Yeah, it might be in terms of minutes level for a hundredth of a, in a, a year. Though, I don't know. Yeah. How would you measure that a year is tens of seconds different from the previous one? Yeah, and there's a bunch of weird timing issues. The sun's a disk; it's not a point source, so a lot oh, of the time gosh. stuff is, is, is complicated. So the I guess the system's a mess. We've been through this. We've been through thing. this. So you, do you look at the sun, or do you look? Is there a clever way you can look at the stars or something to work out? No, because they stay. That's why I was thinking it might telescopes and stars to get. But now there's a thing called a sidereal year, oh, no. or a sidereal day, because we measure our day. It's a, our day of 24 hours is not how long it takes the Earth to orbit, because the, with the Earth is also moving relative to the Sun. So yeah, we yeah. define a day. I'm going to be the Earth for this purpose, because I'm on a chair. Oh, oh gosh, here we go. <laughs> you're the, you, everyone watching, you're the Sun, I'm the Earth, right? And so you think a day would be, wait, I need to spin this way. This, this is, uh, there's a nor uh, up north in northern, above the, 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 the solar system plane and down. So. You'd think it would be 24 hours from looking at the sun all the way around to looking at the sun. But that's not what happens. Because while I've been doing that, the, um, the sun has moved. So the sun, while I'm spinning, has rotated around a bit. So if I did my full rotation, I'm not looking back at the sun. After one full rotation, the sun's over there now. And so because we define a day relative to the sun, and we move relative to the sun, a day is not a full rotation of the Earth. Whereas a sidereal day is the same concept, but relative to the stars in the galaxy, which are far enough away that we don't have that effect at the resolution of the Earth. So, so a sidereal day is a different length to a solar day. This is and the same as, um, oh, this is a different YouTube video to promote, I guess, that's not yours and not mine, but um, there's, a, there's a SAT question that everyone got wrong because- Oh, really? Well, so it's, it, all of the options are wrong because the person writing the question is wrong. I think is the punchline, but hey, there's a circle. People have seen the thumbnail. There's a circle rolling around another circle. Oh, this is Veritasium's video. Yeah, <laughs> a circle rolling around another circle. And the kind of punchline is it does an extra spin that you weren't expecting because it's been on a journey. Yeah, sure. um, yes. This is the same thing, but- Very similar, <laughs> yes. So um, you, because, yeah, the sun's moving, it, it's, it's all a mess. And so, when you say the sun's moving, you mean relative to us in a sort of pretend, sun, pretend yeah, geocentric Earth, world. <laughs> Chat's very, chat's very excited. Um, so actually, the maths you have to do for these sorts of things is very complicated because you care about our solar orbit and our position around the, the sun in terms of the year. But if you're measuring it using stars, you're doing sidereal measurements, not solar system measurements. But you know, we have the maths to fix that and understand it, but it just means it's not as it's not as straightforward as put a stick in the ground and, and time a shadow. So Aya in chat says it's twenty three hours fifty six minutes. Anonymous thinks maybe fifty seven minutes, and yeah, I think yeah. I think you can derive that by your knowledge that a year is about three hundred sixty five. It's sort of yeah. one part one part in three six five or something. So everything in the solar system, if you look down on the solar system. Yes. Everything goes counterclockwise or anti-clockwise. 
So if I'm the Earth, that's why I stand. I, I went anti-clockwise. Oh, like in uh, the picture. But then I'm also orbiting you, the Sun, in an anti-clockwise direction. So I had it the wrong way. I moved the laptop the wrong way because I should move the laptop this way because I'm. I would be going in orbit around there. So when I do this little spin, I come in early. Ah, you're already there. Whereas before, you were over there. Yeah. And so that's why it's ever so slightly shorter sidereal day than solar. Does one of the planets spin backwards? A or spin at a weird angle? Venus barely spins. Okay. That one's not side. The, the, if anyone's looking at going into astronomy or astrophysics and you see anything weird happening with any kind of planet, the answer is always ah, something, something collisions. So. <laughs> The argument is just, you know, there was a momentumous enough collision that knocked it on its side or, or altered the rotation rate. But the ones that do go the other way go the other way very, very slowly. Like they're barely going the other way. I, I think you can set up something like that in... Okay, like mumble mumble snooker, mumble mumble backspin, and then it exactly, bounces. Yeah, now it bounces blah, blah, and then blah, it's not. Blah, 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 mumble mumble blah, blah, collisions, yeah, good. Okay. <laughs> just write that in your exams. Get yeah. This is a revision stream now. Mumble, mumble, collisions. <laughs> we got gotcha. you. Uh, chat's backing us up on Venus and maybe also Uranus. Excellent. Got a chat. Okay, so is there, was there a point in the story where there's a change in how leap years work, different countries have done different things for different amounts of time, yep. and then at some point, I think you mentioned countries have to skip a bunch of days to try and... Yeah. What's going on there? Because the difference between the, the um, Julian way of doing this and the Gregorian way of doing this is, is taking out more days. The, the correct way, Gregorian, is taking out more days because the Julian method was... was uh, the, the approximation number was too high. It was doing 365.25, and it should have been a little bit smaller. So it means whoever was sticking with the, with the um, Julian calendar was adding in too many days. And at some point, you've got to give those days back if you want to get back into alignment. And so that happened in the UK in the 1700s, 1800s sometimes. Um, it happened, I think it's very interesting because if anyone's watching from America, um, for a long time the US and the UK did kind of the same thing because it was one, one big country. And then there was this whole falling out. And then, and then everyone didn't want to do the same thing as the other country. And so there's a bunch of old conventions or things that England used to do that are kind of fossilized into the US um, metric units and imperial units and all these things. But this conversion happened just before, which is why I think it was mid 1700s, right before the um, War of Independence. Um, I think it would be very interesting if this had happened just a little bit later or the US had split up a little bit sooner we could be in a situation where one of the two countries flips had, had flipped their calendar and the other hadn't. But it, it turns out it happened right before. So, so effectively, the US and the UK at the same time switched from the Julian calendar to the Gregorian calendar, which involved kicking out, I think, something like 11 days. The chat can back me up on some number of days had to be checked out. And that is a nightmare now for historians because if you're looking at a, a, an event in the past that's been documented by more than one country, depending on which calendar which country was used, they would write down different dates to mean exactly the same day, which is just very complicated. For, you know, it, was a big, it was a long, long transitional period, and it was very confusing looking at historical records from that time because everything's out. And actually, if you look at any UK records where you're like, oh, it's been thousand years or whatever since thing happened no it hasn't because we skipped 11 days so we, in theory we should be offsetting by 11 days not using the same date um, but nobody ever bothers which is very upsetting. and in case anyone's thinking oh I, i've got excel and excel has a it's got a dates function right which assigns a number to each day so that it can keep track of what day things are happening i think the excel function unless they've patched it doesn't even get the year 1900 right it breaks on there's something interesting it breaks on and what's what I found particularly interesting from a from a software point of view is that was a bug that was in a a version a spreadsheet a bit of software that predated Excel called like Lotus I think Lotus one two three something like that yeah, and they wanted to make everything compatible 
And so they had to implement the same date bug in the <laughs> early Excel. People can fact check this for me. And I think you're right. I think you're right. So it all lines up, which I think is very, very funny. And it the um, the problems kept going for quite a while. I think the most recent one I know of is Russia was one of the last countries to change from the Julian calendar to the Gregorian calendar. And at the London Olympics around the turn of the previous century, around 1900, the Russian, I think it was, one of their teams showed up late because they showed up on the date that was said, but they showed up on that date on the Julian calendar, not on the Gregorian calendar. You but mean I 1900? Think, not even yeah, that long ago. Not that long ago. But for, uh, for the last century, we've pretty much had this sorted, so that's not that. <laughs> pretty much, eh? Pretty much. Yeah. We've stuck to this system, right? So this was introduced in either 1582 or 17-something. Oh, why have I written 1582 if I'm just going to put 17-something? 17 17-something. 17 oh, the chat would tell us. When was, when was the lost date? I think it's 11. Um, the calendar boom in 1583. Yeah, good times to make calendars. <laughs> and we've stuck, we've stuck with it in that format for well, going on almost 500 years, which is... Yeah, not bad. Oh, and everyone's saying that everything in the universe moves. Yes, well done, <laughs> you are correct. It's, it's, an, it's a sloshy mess the whole way up. I liked the comment about things being relative, so that's what you're does measuring against. Other than around its axis. Well, it's, it's the solar system processes, so... Strictly speaking, the sun moves around, not its axis, but the common center of gravity with it and the rest of the solar system, which moves around, but that is always physically inside the sun. So the center of mass of the solar system is inside the sun, so the sun does a weird kind of dance around that. Um, but we are, the, the spiral arm of the Milky Way that we're in is moving. The Milky Way is moving towards the Andromeda galaxy and within the cosmic web, there's movement on that scale as well, so you know everything moves. It's slightly unsettling, really, to be reminded that you're just on a lump of rock hurtling through space with nothing yeah. nailed down. Yeah. And when you look up at the night sky, that's just inky blackness of stuff that we're flying through. Maybe that's one way to put it, but yes. It's not the cheery way to put it, is it? Right, okay. <laughs> cheery, cheery maths time. Um, people are telling us about dates of switches. Yeah, 1582 according to Wikipedia for one for some countries and 17 something for some other countries, which I suppose matters because whether or not you have 1600 in the range, does that yeah. then matter? Anyway. Someone else pointing out that the Earth is on the back of a massive turtle, so that's worth bearing in mind too. It's a good point. Yeah, got to allow for that. Um, so now, now our issue is, James, yeah. that the Gregorian method, we can all agree, pretty good. But not perfect. So I I have a I have a you you have a solution as well, I believe, which is different to my solution. Yeah, mine is well mine is less interesting. So let's let's yeah. do yours first. <laughs> mine is mine is scrap the whole thing, right? This this whole uh well not scrap the whole thing, sorry. Let me let me rephrase that. Keep the putting it in every every four years years because that's so close to being good but then instead of this complicated take one out every hundred years but put one back in every 400 years I propose we just take one out every 128 years which um, right. is a power of two so it's a wonderful year we're going to celebrate that anyway and so every 128 years we just whoop, one back out again and so if we are I'm just going to like uh, run that into a calculator right now yeah, I was going to... One divided by... So that's, oh, that's so close. That takes out an extra, if you want to write this down. Yeah, yeah, It takes yeah. out 0 0.0078125. Oh, I see. So that, and that's pretty close to the 781 that you were yeah. talking right. That, okay, that's, that's exactly what you need. That's so exactly what you need. That to the 0.25, we've got too much. Take away that much. Then you end up with, get ready for this. Yeah, 365 point something. Point two four two oh. one oh. eight seven five eight seven five. So 
the which rounds to two point two <laughs> to 0. 0.24219. So yeah. that's pretty pretty tight. That's I know. pretty close. Um, chat asked how many digits of this number are known, and I I didn't have the heart to tell chat that this number is not constant. That it's changing oh, all the time. So, yeah. yeah, that's if you look too closely at this number, then oh my goodness. Um, if you go far enough out, it's just a fluctuating mess because the the length of a day is constantly changing. It's something like some years Jupiter is a bit closer to us than it's the sun and slows us down or something, so it takes yeah, us longer to get back round. When some of the bigger dams have been built, <gasps> because they're moving the distribution of mass on the Earth. Oh, this... where our mass is relative to the axis of rotation makes a difference to the period of spin. We can, we can, humans have built things that have changed the length of a day though, within, our, within our measurement ability. So, right, because so it's a ratio of the two numbers of how long it takes you to get round and how fast you spin. Yeah. Um, so yeah, problem. And we can um, adjust. I mean, we and nature are constantly messing with how long it takes us to spin. Uh, I've just got some sort of YouTube warning message, which happens sometimes. But chat, chat will let us know if <laughs> things broken or gone weird. Right, good. Yeah, you know, we can just carry on having our having our chat. Okay, I kind of so, so I respect this for coming up with a very close number. How did you pick one hundred and twenty-eight? What's the nice number? I think I don't. I, I don't think that's an original idea. I think I read online that that's closer. But what you what you can do, this is the way. You, you'd reverse engineer it. You'd work out what the difference is. So we were saying before, I'm gonna put it in the calculator right now, the difference was 0 0.00, what we say it was uh, 781. And now if I take the inverse of that, it's 128.04097. So we got lucky that the, the inverse is very close to a multiple of four which means yeah. we can just take out, we just don't put in a leap year on that, on that one. If it had been different, then what we'd have to do is have an anti-leap day. So, like, let's say I did this and it comes up like with 127, 126 or something. We would have to put in all the normal leap days every four years, but then every now and then, just less than once a century, we'd have to skip the 28th of February. Right. Take, have a negative leap day. And that's my birthday, so I'm not having that. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, so I'll, I'll get involved there. Oh, I I wanna... Was it, and also, once every 127 years, that's going to be, even if we're using binary, that would be, that'd be nasty. But, um, exactly. but one every, one, every 128, I think, is a, a lovely, lovely number, lovely rhythm. And it would be a real special occasion. Like, most people wouldn't even see one in their, would most people no. see one in their lifetime? Hmm. Most people are not. Oh, yeah. hang on. Maybe half of. <laughs> Most people wouldn't see two. <laughs> you wouldn't see two. Correct. Very, very few people would see two. Maybe on average, everyone would see one. You'd have two to be thirds of people. You'd have to be born in the. Let's say you get eighty years on the clock. Oh, yeah. okay. I reckon maybe two thirds of people would see one. Just yeah. ballparking. Maybe yeah. One. Okay. Answer. Give or take. But that's pretty special, you know? And people would be like, oh, it's a shame it's such a null event because all, all it is is not having a thing, which is very sad, but, you know, that's um, maths for you. Yeah. So this, this, process of, this process of identifying the kind of closest one over number is really similar to how continued fractions work. Um, oh, yeah. I know you mentioned continued fractions in the video from eight years ago, but okay. um, <laughs> so it feels weird for me to explain continued fractions now. But uh, there's it. a way to approximate numbers using uh, using fractions like this, where you you continuously do this kind of reciprocal thing on the way down. Um, the way it works is you take the <laughs> the structure you're trying to build is like a whole number plus one over something and then repeat the process so here i guess we would we would take um whatever we would we're looking for a whole number to put here plus one over and then a whole number to put here and then one over a whole number to put here they're called continued fractions because you continue putting fractions inside your fractions go there we go um so the, the i guess the process where you repeatedly doing these reciprocals 
um, gives you a nice way to express your fraction. I say nice, sort of a mess of nested, nested reciprocals and things. Um, if you run that for 365, you get, I've got it on a bit of paper here, so this is slightly cheesy. Um, <laughs> if you run that for 365, then it's um, 1 over 1 plus 4 plus 1 over 1 plus 7. Let's do this properly. So I'd calculate, there's the 1 over 4, and then the leftover bit is not quite, it's not quite 1 quarter, it's, it's sort of 1 and 1 over 4 and a seventh, kind of, if you, if you do take the kind of logical continuation. This isn't 4, it's 4 plus 1 over something, kind of 1 over 7. And then down here there's like a 1, and then a 3, and then 24 or something. Um, but these are surprisingly easy to calculate, um, maybe not for this number, but um, where, you know, this digits, these digits are really hideous. But it's surprisingly easy to calculate what numbers you need to put in here just by sort of repeatedly repeatedly doing one over stuff and subtracting the integer part. Um, if you've got a calculator, it's the sort of thing where you just go for it. Um, to build these kind of nested fractions. These um, were, I think it was the 1800s, these were all the rage continued fractions? Yeah, people like Dirichlet are working on these. So that, that lines up with my impressions where I have to go Excellent. by which it's mathematicians have got their names on stuff. People don't often think about mathematics having like different crazes or fads or things coming in and out of fashion. But very much over the century, different bits of maths come in and out of favor. And for, for a while, continued fractions like this were, were everywhere. Everyone was doing them. Every number you do this, it was a standard thing to learn. And then it just kind of, we just stopped doing it. Everyone's like, eh, we're bored of them now. And, yeah. and we, we looked at other ways to represent these numbers. So yeah, so if you if you read old maths writing from 150 years ago, you'll see a lot more continued fractions showing up. They have some nice inter interplay with um, sequences and recursion relations, and um, there's some really beautiful relations between things like roots of quadratics and their continued fractions. I guess I'm now talking like an 1800s mathematician, like oh, can I interest <laughs> you in quadratic equations? You're um, just in the pocket of big fraction. I just love big fractions. Um, <laughs> they give you, so they give you, um, if you get bored and stop, then you get a hideous expression for a nice, a nice rational number. Um, like if I stop just before this 24, so I have to decide 1 over 24, that's tiny. So if I stop here, then, okay, it's written in a stupid format, but this is a fraction. Um, and it's, a, it's an approximation to the number that you were writing. You've kind of made your best effort along the way to write the the biggest biggest integer smaller than your leftover remainder, and you end up with something that's an approximation to the number. Um, yep, uh, Andre and Zoe in chat know that in, if instead of three six five four seven one three twenty four random numbers, if you make all of these one, then you get that the golden ratio. Sneaky golden ratio. But yeah, I know, I know. Wait till I you see root two. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> but then that does lead you down the rabbit hole of trying root three, which is oh, even root better. Classic root three. Classic root three um, continued fraction. Um, oh, I brought a root three show and tell if you want to see. Oh yeah, is it? Yeah, hang on. Yeah, yeah, do your show. Yeah, do your show and tell. Let me just grab it over here. This. Uh, so, yeah. Sorry, I should have put it on root. Where did I put it? Oh, I moved it. Give me one second. It's worth it, I swear. Okay, so my most recent video, not most recent video, one of my more recent videos is about the square root of three. And there are two seemingly unrelated facts in that video. And one is, if you have an equilateral triangle, which you can, I'm holding up here, um, and instead of having a, a unit length saying that's one, if instead we say this is two, so that means half of it is one. There's the classic one, two, and then the, the, the height here, that's root three in the equilateral triangle. So it gives you your one, two, root three um, triangle. And so some of the facts in my video about root three, they're all related to the fact that the height in the equilateral triangle is root three. Separately, um, I point out in a cube, so I've just I've distorted this to form some but not all of the edges of a cube, that distance from that corner to the opposite corner, the space diagonal is also root three, 
because if you do Pythagoras in 3D, you've got a single unit, single unit, single unit. And so the diagonal is the square root of 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 1 squared. Good old Pythagorean 3D. That's also root 3. And I had both those facts in my video. And then I, a friend of mine came up to me earlier this week, and they said, oh, hey, um, this, this triangle lets you show both. And did you realize that if the distance from there to there is root 3, and if you turn it into a cube, that distance from there to there is still root 3, it's actually root 3 for every single in-between state. So that's every, every, all of, they, they did the equations to work it out in general. Every step between there and there is root 3. So you hold so them perfectly still and just twist. Yeah, it's, that's so it's hard to do. If I got a bit of wire, I could run it from one to the other and they would not budge. I can try and hold them still going from cube to equilateral triangle. That's my friend um, Sabetta, if, uh, Matt Samosa. If anyone watches Sabetta's um, videos on YouTube, she came up to me, she's like, check it out. And I was like, that's amazing. So that was my very exciting Route 3 fact. We'll, we'll try and link in the further, further reading notes as well. To, he's to tangentially stuff. related to... Yeah, well done. <laughs> Excellent show. Excellent yeah. show and tell. Have they been on number file as well? I feel like I've seen... Sabetta has done number file. Yeah. Not that we're encouraging young people to get tattoos, but Sabetta has a lot of interesting mathematical tattoos and has done number file videos based on those. So we can put, we'll put, if, if there are places we can put links, we will... Um, there are places we can put links. Um, okay, we've got... Yeah, how do you even prove that mathematically? Just to engage. Chat's, chat's interested in... Oh, oh it's, uh, you know, I don't know how she did it. We'll have to ask. I need to find out. I, I think it could be a fun follow-on video showing how, how she did that. Yeah. There'll be a way, like a lot of stuff she does is with like 3D mechanics things. There'll be a way of setting up, you can set up equations, with the degrees of freedom, and then there'll be a bunch of stuff will cancel out or there's some invariant which will give you like that distance between the two. So that's a very hand wavy answer because I haven't done it, but if we ask her very nicely. Yeah, I have no idea. I guess the six midpoints are on a hexagon or something, and then straight lines, and there's then opposite. There's something hexagony when you're Ooh. in the. Yeah, uh, look, there's a hexagon. Form, but it, look at all these, all the messy in betweens. I remember, I loved. I did a little bit of um, mechanical engineering when I was an undergrad, and I loved these things which are like, you've got an arm, there's this this length moving with this change in angle per second and it's attached to another arm this length moving at this rate you know, what speed and trajectory <laughs> and end point and you just gotta set up all these equations and then crunch them through to work out um, what drops out and so i suspect it's a complicated version of that to give you a okay okay future video that people can get ahead of so he says that this has happened yeah. before <laughs> so he was working on doubles and dice rolls just at the moment that you put a video out um, I think this has oh, happened. Okay. Uh, Zoe in chat says, uh, I don't know which video this is. Doubles, yeah, doubles, doubles and dice rolls. rolls. Maybe just over a year ago. Ooh. Proof by physics, build it in the real world. Good work. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I, doubles and dice rolls was analyzing in games if you're allowed to roll two dice and then pick the highest one. What's your average result to get? Yeah. Because that's. It's, it's inter interesting, but of mathematics. That's an advantage in Dungeons and Dragons, right? It's I think we're done. Right, okay. Right. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but it, if people watching in the future do see a video about that, you'll know that's that's the backstory. So, um, but, but I'll learn more maths. But to get back to our continued fractions, I do like the fact once you've drawn that stop, I actually find it quite satisfying to roll the fraction back up again. Yeah. You, you can now turn it back because once you've drawn a line, you know, once you've sectioned off the rest of the infinitely many terms. You can now, depending on what the number is, you can now roll that back up to get a nice rational approximation. Yeah, it goes something like um, one and a third is four thirds, then flip it to get three quarters. I need to write yeah. that down. <laughs> seven and three quarters. So I've got one over seven and three quarters. Here's a four and a one plus still to roll up. So that's 20, 31 over four, but flip it. I need to write that down. Am I, am I right? 31 over four? 28 and 3, yeah, 31 over 4, I think. Oh, this is a terrible mistake. Um, and then 4 times 31 is 124, plus 4 is 128, so that gives you 31 over 128. 
oh, I feel like I'm on um, countdown. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 31 over 128, which That's is exactly one quarter. One quarter would be 32 over 128. Take off that 128. I guess you remember. It is. 365, that is your, that is your number. But, James, you've also got a solution. Yeah, mine's, mine's, mine's less... Hang on, I think I should probably put us in quotes, because yours is... Yours is maybe continued fractions, or you say someone else might have seen it before. And mine is definitely not mine. But now that I've seen it, it appeals to it appeals to the mathematician in me, and also the administrator in me, um, which is a new part of my job for IT administration a lot as well. Uh, it works like this. Um, you time travel back to meet Pope Gregory um, and the mathematicians. They've just decided to do one quarter minus 100, one over 100, Fine, okay, that gives you the point two four, and they're just about to add something. Uh, wait, does that give you what does that give you? Yeah, that gives you the two four. They're just about to add something, and you intervene at that moment in history because they're about to add one over four hundred, which is like adding a two five here. There it is, we saw this two five. Um, this is clearly the wrong thing to add. Really, they should just add two, that would be better because. This number 219 is closer to being 2 than it is to being 25. Like, I'm, I'm not, a mile, not miles out, not miles in it, but 19 is closer to 0 than 50, um, which practically means that you just, yeah, 19 is closer to 0 than, than 50 is Hang the on, thing. You shout, you, shout, you shout that at the Pope as well um, in the past. Um, and I sort of think they must have been a bit aware that they were aiming for something like this. I don't know. They didn't do 700 or 300. Um, so my proposal is we just, we, we do the skipping a leap year thing, yep. but only every 500 years. And the brilliant news is that we don't actually need to time travel because that is what we've been doing. <laughs> the only time it's come up was the year 2000. 2000, we only had one. Which was a multiple of 400, but it's also a multiple of 500. So we can wreck on this and pretend that's what we were doing all along. <laughs> we don't... And it's not a problem until we get to yeah. 2000. By 2400, we have to make a choice. 2400, we have to make a choice. Are we going with 400 because that's what the Pope said? Or are we going with 500? Because that's what James slightly said. Slightly better? Yeah, it's, it's me versus the Pope. Um, <laughs> classic. classic a classic fight. But, um, yeah. Uh, and that's it. So it appeals to the bureaucracy in me that it wouldn't be very much effort to switch to this. It's sort of sort of free bonus that you just everyone agree that we're going to we're going to not do a thing in 2400 yours oh, I don't know so yours is nice we've got a we've got a multiple of 128 coming up soon so if we're doing this do we have to I like that you've kicked the can down the road though I have kicked the can down the road by about 400 years yeah if you're watching this YouTube video in the year 2400 then I'm really sorry <laughs> yeah. um so the one two eight thing, I think, I think is it's so much more accurate. That is, it's very tempting as a mathematician to. But <sighs> it's so good. It's backed up by continued fractions. <laughs> yeah. So I actually don't know which one I prefer really. This kind of status quo because you don't have to tell anyone. One over five hundred yeah. because similar but slightly better. Neat. And the, the decisions in the future. This is so far in the future. And it's one two eight thing, which involves powers of two, binary years, um, continued fractions, Real uniting, precision. and really precise. Um, I I don't know which one I prefer, and I'm going to put it to chat. Um, so <laughs> I've got a vote for this. Just in the last couple of minutes, if you're watching live, you can vote in chat for either current system, uh, <laughs> current system. Uh, James's 500 system or Matt's 128 system. Oh, the current system is not doing well. Remotely. Is not doing well. <laughs> oh, it's 50 50. Oh, I'm currently drawing. Oh, that's very exciting. I could watch this for a while. <laughs> okay, we're, we're about to hit six o'clock. Um, not, okay, not allowing for any leap seconds, um, give or take, which we didn't get onto. I could put leap seconds in the, in the further reading notes, perhaps. Um, is there anything you want to link people to or let people know about? I mean, okay. triangles are great. Um, oh, my, 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 book, my next book about geometry and trigonometry 
the pre-orders have started. So if you really want to read a book in several months' time, you can <laughs> pre-order Love Triangle. But it the won't book's be cool. out until the 20th of June. So you've got a bit of time to read that. We've got ages. Okay. So the book's called Love Triangle coming out in 2024. If you want to read a Matt Parker book now that already exists that people can get. It's most... uh, yeah, Humble Pie is out and about and things to make and do in the fourth dimension. Fantastic yeah, stuff. Google, Google um, books. Or you can watch YouTube for free. That's the other way around. There's like so much YouTube for free. For, yeah, YouTube for free. Um, I'm going to stop the vote. Oh, it's, uh, stop the count, I think. You have won. You have won oh, the poll. Yes. Sixty yes. forty. Oh, it is pretty pretty good. The important um, thing is, no one voted for the current system. So nobody's voted for the current system. Like yeah, we'll take that. Okay. Um, thank you so much for coming on the show, Matt. My pleasure. Um, people in chat are very excited about. I think triangles mostly. Um, they want to know about the content of your book. Like, are there tetrahedrons? Are there squares? People have got to people have got to find out by reading the book. I think. Um, We'll be back in 167 hours for another episode of the Oxford Online Maths Club. Till then, have a good evening, uh, have a good week. Bye from me. Bye. <laughs> Take care, everyone. See you.